The building project has been complete. The walls of Jerusalem uh, are repaired and the doors of the gates have been hung. And now the real work begins. The, the, The real work is not bricks and mortar, it never was. The real work is the people of God. And in chapter 1, we saw that God had put a concern on Nehemiah's heart, and it was uh, on his heart to repair the walls of the city and to uh, repair its gates. But now in chapter 7, almost mirroring chapter 1, God puts another concern on the heart of his servant Nehemiah. And you can see that that concern in verses 4 to 5. We read, the city was wide and large, but the people within it were few, and no housing had been built. Then my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles and the officials and the people. This is the turning point in the book of Nehemiah. This is where, from this point forward, we will see how the people of Jerusalem are themselves gradually, spiritually restored. You see, it wasn't just the city, the bricks and mortar that needed restoring. It was the people of God who had returned from years of exile in Babylon. They needed restoring. And this is the real purpose of Nehemiah's work. And the first thing we see Nehemiah doing is assembling and organising the people who have returned from exile and are living in the surrounding area of Jerusalem and Judea. And he and he has three main concerns. Now, I have a confession before I give you these three main concerns. As I was, and, and I promise you, this is not me reading something onto a text. This is, so, this is me reading something out of the text and going, that's where we got it from. Uh, in our elders meetings monthly, uh, since we've been an eldership, appoint, uh, been appointed by the church as elders, Pastor Barry has led us in our meetings with three items every month. If Jeff was in here, I'd ask him what they were and he'd be able to tell you immediately what they were. And I've been to various uh, meetings with elders of other churches in revitalization projects with Pastor Barry, and it's always these three uh, agenda items. Leadership, membership, stewardship. And these are the three things we see that are on Nehemiah's heart as he begins to organise and assemble the people of God. These are some of the three building blocks that as a church, to be a healthy church, we need to be often thinking about. Leadership, membership and stewardship. I want to convince you that these are foundational principles for that for a healthy church, as we see Nehemiah concerned for them. And I want to show you that as Nehemiah was concerned for them, we as a church must be concerned for them. So let's just take them one by one and let me show you from the passage where these are uh, in chapter 7. So firstly, we see in verses 1 to 4, that Nehemiah was concerned for the leadership of God's people, the leadership of God's people. So having having repaired the city, having uh, put the walls in, what do we read in verse verse 1? He begins the, the, the task of appointing leaders over the people in the city. There are those, first and foremost, who he appoints to lead the worship of God's people in the temple. Uh, So look at verse 1. Now, when the wall had been built and I had set up the doors and the gatekeepers, the singers and the Levites uh, had been appointed. So gatekeepers, singers and Levites, in particular singers and Levites, are appointed to lead the worship in God's temple. Then he appoints, and this is his main point, he appoints his brother, Hanani, and another man called Hananiah to come and oversee, to govern the entire city. 
Now, what was it that qualified Hanani and Hananiah to be in charge of God's people? Was it that they were uh, connected to Nehemiah because Hanani in particular was his brother? No. There are actually completely different reasons. Was it because they were uh, the most skilled of all the workers in the city, that on the wall, they, their part of the wall was the best part of the wall? No. It was more to do with their character than anything else. You see, we're told that these men were faithful men. They were faithful men. Now, specifically, this is referring to Hananiah, what Nehemiah says in verse 2. I gave my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the governor of the castle, charge over Jerusalem, for he was more faithful. Speaking specifically of Hananiah, but it is true of Hanani. If you go back to chapter 1 of Nehemiah, you'll remember that Hanani had been the one who had originally travelled from Jerusalem to the citadel of Susa, the king's winter residence, where Nehemiah was serving the emperor Artaxerxes as cupbearer. And in the palace at Susa, Hanani told Nehemiah about the state of the city's walls and the condition of the people. And it was at that time Nehemiah had this concern to return to Jerusalem to see the work begun of rebuilding this city and the walls. And since that time, Hanani, his brother, has been with him from beginning to end. Hanani was beside Nehemiah, working faithfully on the wall, helping him complete the task God had given him to do. When it got tough, he didn't down tall and go home. When they were persecuted, he didn't run away and hide. He, through thick and thin, through difficulty and ease, in comfort and in times of trial, Hanani proved he was a faithful servant of God, sticking by his brother. And the same can be true, though we know less about Hananiah. Hananiah had worked faithfully and so much so that he had proven to Nehemiah that he was more faithful than most men in the city. And that is the reason he was chosen to be one of the leaders overseeing the city of Jerusalem. But there was another reason. Not only was he faithful, but he was God-fearing. He was more faithful and God-fearing man than many. Both of them were God-fearing. The reason they were faithful to Nehemiah was because both of them feared almighty God. Now remember, we've looked at what it means to fear God previously. It does not mean that we shrink back from God in terror, though it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a, of a holy and angry God at sin. It, and we should, in a sense, quake at the thought of being confronted by a holy God. But what it more specifically means to be a God-fearer is to live, as we were hearing in the children's talk, for the glory of God. It's to live for an audience of one. What my main motivation as a Christian is, is not what you think of me. That, that ought to be the case. It ought to be the case for every one of us. But what God thinks of me. At the end of the day, none of us will stand before each other in judgment, we will stand before Jesus Christ in judgment. And and our good and our bad, yes, are saved, but our good, our bad, our indifferent, our apathy, our lethargy, our zeal, our enthusiasm, all will be weighed before his judgment seat. And and we're, we're we're told that the Lord Jesus Christ will be our judge, not to, to determine whether we're saved or not, because if he's 
a saviour having died on the cross and we put our faith in him. We have nothing to fear. We, we won't be excluded. Uh, but there will be levels of reward. And so, uh, so it's to live for an audience of one. And we've read already in chapter 5 how the nobles and officials in Jerusalem had failed to live in the fear of God. How did they fail to live in the fear of God? They extorted the people, putting heavy taxes on them in order that they might line their own pockets. And while the people lived in poverty, they lived in luxury. This is God's people exploiting other of God's people. But Hanai and Hananiah were leaders who would not do that. They were servants of the living God. They, they, they were living to please him. They feared him. They wouldn't mistreat the people in that way. And so they were chosen to be those overseeing the city. Now, just as Nehemiah appointed faithful and God-fearing leaders, so the church needs to do the same. You see, the, when we, we, we have a problem in, in our culture, and I'm just going to be frank about this. We evaluate a man's ministry based on his smooth talk or his powerful uh, oratory or his abilities, his wonderful abilities to, to kind of gather a people and... Ability is important, but not primary. What is primary in the leaders of God's people ought to be character. Ought to be character. What is that person like? Not only when they're at church, but when they're at home. What is their personality like? How do they treat outsiders? Not only how do they treat the people of God. And you know, this is important for us as a church because as, as God has led us to send others to serve, and can I just say, let's stop using phrases like they're going. We're sending. Please, it, it, the language does make a difference. We are sending. And we, we're going to do that with a little bit of tears, but we're going to do that with a lot of joy because this is God's work, not ours. And, and, and as we send, as God has led us to send, we're in need of recognising and appointing more leaders within the church. And as, as we look to appoint and, and as we're praying about it as a church, I, I know you are, as we're praying about it as a church, at home in our individual lives, we, as we uh, look to appoint new elders, additional deacons. We must first think about their character. We must ask if they would be good examples of faithfulness to God in the church and at home. And we must look to see if the way they live indicates that they are living in the fear of God. Leaders who are appointed for the gifts, for their gifts, may succeed for a time, but when their character is left out of the equation, it spells disaster for God's people longer term. There's the leadership of God's people, but secondly, uh, we see in verses 5 to 69, it's a good chunk of our, our chapter, that Nehemiah was concerned for the membership of God's people. Not only leadership, but membership. He was concerned for the membership of God's people. So he's appointed faithful leaders. Now Nehemiah uh, goes rummaging and he finds an old membership directory, if you like. He, he finds a census that has been taken. And this census uh, makes for interesting reading uh, for, for God's people, particularly for God's people who are trying to lead the current people of God. Um, because uh, it's a record of everyone who had returned under the leadership of Zerubbabel nearly 80 years beforehand. 
And now, now, why is this list given such prominence? Because if Nehemiah is the author of Ezra and Nehemiah, he records this twice. So um, those churches who have done what we haven't done, which is begin with Ezra and end with Nehemiah and just do one long series of Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, you, if we had done that, we would have been looking at this list twice. Uh, so what, what, is it, what is so important about this? Well, that it's repeated twice. Because don't forget in, in, the, uh, in the Old Testament uh, uh, arranged how the Jews would typically arrange it, Ezra and Nehemiah are just one book. They're not two books. It's our Christian Bibles that separated them. Well, what, what is so important about this list of members or of members of the covenant community and the numbers of how many are in the covenant community? Well, three things. It showed who could belong. It showed who could belong. This list means nothing to us in many ways, does it? We, lots of names that are really hard to pronounce and can pronounce, be pronounced in several different ways. Just listen to, back to the reading I just gave, and you'll see I pronounced at least two names very differently to one another. Um, but though they mean very little to us, they were essential to God's people at that time. Because to be on that list meant that you and your family were recognized as being part of God's covenant nation as they returned from foreign lands as they returned from a time where they were slaves and they go home it's important that they know who God's people really are why well it goes back to Abraham the forefather the patriarch it was to Abraham that God gave the promises of blessing. That he said, Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation and through you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. And he promised blessing on that people, on Abraham and his descendants. So if you're returning to the land that God promised Abraham and his descendants and you don't, you can't prove you belong, you don't have any land to claim. You you don't have the blessings of God to claim. They needed to prove they were descendants of Abraham. This list shows who could belong, but it also showed who could serve. Verses 61 to 65, we read about some people who could not prove their ancestry. And among those people were some of the priests, some of the Levites, those who could only, be, uh, could only serve as priests, but they could not prove that they belonged. And so the result of that, they were excluded from the priesthood. They could not serve in the temple because they would be handling ho- holy things. And the, the, the priests were not willing to, to risk, Nehemiah, Ezra before him and others were not willing to risk the unholy people, people not appointed by God to serve him, would handle holy things and bring profanity on those holy things, bring defilement to his temple. But then it not only showed who could, uh, who belonged and who, uh, who could serve, but it showed who could partake. The, these, these priests who couldn't prove their ancestries were also instructed not to partake of the holy food. That holy food was the offerings that the people had made that the priests alone were able to consume. And, uh, and, and once again, this is about defilement. If they're not the appointed people, if they are not the priests that God had appointed then they would bring defilement into the temple and onto the holy things and so dishonour God. And so here here, here for them, being part of the covenant community, this is what this great big list that we read actually means. It meant you belonged. You belonged as God's people, Israel. It meant that you served. 
You were able to serve God in the temple as a priest if you, were, if you could prove that you were a priest. And it meant you could partake of those holy foods, the privileges that come with covenant membership. And in a similar way to Nehemiah, as a church, we are concerned for the membership of God's community. We, uh, we, we believe in practising formal membership. Why do we practice formal membership? Well, because when we enter membership in a church, in a local church, we are saying three things. We are saying that we belong to Christ's body, that we, we belong to the brothers and sisters of Christ in this local community. We belong to Jesus. He is our Lord. He is our Saviour. We are in the world, but not of the world. We have been saved. And, and it also uh, shows that we, it is, we also say that we are, we are, uh, we are serving God. We are committed to the local church, and in the context of the local church, we will serve him. We, we believe that that is the correct and appropriate context to serve the body of Christ in membership of a local church. And it's in the context of church membership that we enjoy the privileges of being in Christ. We enjoy uh, coming together for the Lord's Supper to take the bread and the wine as a membership of a local church where we, uh, we, we show that we are one together, we have fellowship together and that we are one with Christ who died for us to save us. It is, it is, within, that, it is within that context. We're showing we belong, we're showing we serve, we're showing we partake. And so I'd encourage you this morning, if you're not a church member, why not? Why not? Why not join with us? Why not commit to us? If you, are, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, if you've been baptised, then uh, do, and, you, and you're not a member of any other local church, please come and speak to me at the end, uh, because I want to encourage you to join a local church that preaches and teaches the gospel, a church where you belong, a church where you can serve, and a church where you can partake of its privileges and grow as a Christian. That's what we want for you. We want the best for you. Uh, but first, we must put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and as Andy did last week, go through the waters of baptism. We've got the great joy this, this afternoon as we come to the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table, of welcoming Andrew into church membership. And I pray that maybe any people under the sound of the gospel preaching this morning, uh, that in coming weeks and months, you may also uh, follow. Think about it, pray about it, come and speak to one of the elders uh, if the Lord is putting that on your heart. And the third thing, so we've looked at leadership, we've looked at membership. Let's third, thirdly and finally look at the stewardship of God's people. This is verses 70 to 73. Because not only does this record uh, include the names of the membership, but this record also does something we might find quite shocking. It tells you what they gave. It tells you what they contributed they recorded what was contributed uh, to the work of the building the temple uh, in Jerusalem. And, uh, we, and I just want to give you two lasting principles about stewardship uh, to, to finish with. Two lasting principles about stewardship, about financial giving. They gave willingly. None of those who contributed to the work of rebuilding the temple, were persuaded to do so by manipulative means. No one uh, kind of played soft music and passed the bag uh, while people were weeping, uh, though that passing the bag may not always be a bad thing. Um, and they, uh, but they, they didn't use coercion. No one twisted their arm. No one forced them. No one uh, forced them to give more money than they could afford. The people 
gave to the rebuilding of the temple for God's glory because they wanted to. Because they wanted to. And as God has freely given his own son for our salvation, he wants us to be willing givers, to contribute freely, not coercively, not being, uh, being manipulated to do so. They gave willingly. But I really want you to notice that they gave generously. And it's quite shocking how much they gave. They gave above and beyond their normal tithe. So if you think about this, they would have had a normal, regular tithe that they gave. They, the, a tithe is usually 10%. 10% of their earnings, 10% of their income would have gone to the temple. However, this isn't telling us about their regular tithe. This is telling us about, well, something more. A special contribution towards the building of the temple. They gave gold, they gave items to be used in service, they gave garments for the priests, and it, but, but I want to show you just how generous. If you took all the gold they gave and you worked out uh, its worth today, it would come to over £16 million. Pounds. Over 16... You didn't hear that, did you? Over £16 million. Pounds. They were not an affluent people. They were not a rich people. They had just returned from slavery. They had... You know, slavery is working for free. They had just returned to Jerusalem impoverished. And they give out of their poverty to the temple work willingly and generously and it accumulates just the gold, not even the basins, not even the silver, not even the garments, to over £16 million. Don't worry, I'm not getting a bag out, you can rejoice at that. That is God's people at their best, isn't it? When they see a need, they give to it. Because they don't hold on to their possessions. They, don't, they, they know they're not of this world. They know they belong to a heavenly country and they're citizens of, of, Jesus, of, of Jesus Christ's kingdom and they're, hold, they're, they're holding their material wealth, they're holding the things of this world loosely. And that makes them generous. And, and, and so, to be clear, this isn't, this isn't £16 million just one one rich fella uh, or some poor person giving all their savings this is the whole of god's covenant community so you can imagine it can't you you can imagine the wealthy official and noble of jerusalem who out of his wealth gives and then like that widow in the temple who gave a mite who gave a small thing and the, the disciples looked on as though, what's that? It's nothing in comparison to what others have been given. And Jesus says she gave her all. You don't have to be rich to be generous because God's economy works very differently to our economy. But they, they gave willingly, they gave generously. And just as people were willing and generous stewards then, we as God's people today should be no less generous. We don't have a temple to build, we have a kingdom. And we are, we, we as a church, and I do want to say this as one of the pastors of Dunstable Baptist Church, we are blessed and thankful to God for the regular contributions of God's people. I know we're British, it's uncomfortable to talk about uh, money and giving we don't like it we're conservative in that sense of small c conservative you know we we don't talk about politics religion and money well let's talk about money at least uh it makes up a pretty big part of our lives doesn't it um and i do want to say we give thanks to god for the generosity of his people 
who are regularly giving to the work of the gospel here in this church. But also I want to encourage you to continue giving. Giving what you can. And in coming weeks, just to prepare you as a church, though we are blessed, uh, we will be sharing with you some projects that will require additional funds. We're not asking for a minority of people to give greatly. We'll be asking for as many as possible to give something. And even now, I'd ask you to be thinking and praying before God if there's a way in which you might be able to contribute to some of those projects. We'll be sharing with the membership later on. But let's each of us Each of us consider the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 6 to 8. He says, The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, For God loves a cheerful giver. Not everyone is able to give what others are able to give. That's okay. The the Lord loves a cheerful giver. His economy, his economics are different from our economics. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Next week, we'll see what God does when his people begin to put all these things in place. As God's people assemble, as God's people, uh, as, as God's people come under godly leadership, as God's people come together and show that they belong in covenant community, and as they, as they begin to, to give to the work of the Lord, we'll see what happens. But first and foremost, let me say this. We are nothing without the work of Jesus Christ. We are nothing without the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, the stone the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. The one who was despised by men, hung on a cross, died for our sins, shed his blood to purchase his church, that he might build it and it be a glorious structure. And so, uh, yeah, we can talk about leadership, we can talk about membership, we can talk about stewardship. It's right to talk about these things. These things are biblical. These things are from God's word. But let's not forget that none of these things matter without Jesus Christ and without his spirit. Amen? You're nearly convinced. Jesus Christ is our saviour and Jesus Christ is head of the church. And we look for his blessing because unless he builds the house, the builders work in vain. Amen.